All right, good morning and welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to go through a, a, a few things here to kind of reset us as to why we're doing this. Um, you've saw, seen a little bit from Callista and uh, Krista versions of history, but since at every one of these summits there's going to be new people who are new to this, I think it's important to um, reinforce all of that. Uh, and then um, give you an idea of how we're doing on our commitments that we've made uh, towards RISC V. And, um, but interestingly, this slide, you can see the, the title of this presentation, Unshackling Memory. Um, that title was chosen uh, very specifically, very consciously. And some of you might be thinking, what does this have to do with RISC V? When we saw RISC V, we saw a tremendous opportunity for us to accomplish things uh, that would not be possible uh, with the solutions available in the market. What I don't want people to lose sight of is the ultimate goal, the end vision, the end target was actually to unshackle main memory from the processor. That was really the ultimate end goal. And a little bit later on, um, I'll show you very carefully hidden here what I consider the greatest achievement of that a company has done in the entire industry for the 30 plus years that I've been around. However, I can tell you that most people won't see the significance of what I'm going to show you. And by the way, I'm creating drama, suspense, tension, just so you, because now you're going to, what's he going to show us? Um, but uh, most people won't see it, but I do hope that 30 years from now after I'm dead and people write the book, they will look back on this moment and what's underneath there and say, that's what started the new thing. All right, so with that, let's get started. We'll get through the legal stuff here. So we'll kind of go, uh, again, repeat a little bit of history. Again, I think it's important foundation to kind of go through. And then we'll talk about some of the processing challenges that we're going to go through and then what uh, Western Digital is uh, contributing to that. You've seen a few versions of these, and I think the reason why you're seeing this is because it's so important for everybody to understand the amount of progress that's being made. This was a, a version of an ecosystem chart that I presented in 2017 to show that we already had a number of people who were part of a number of companies that were part of the RISC-V ecosystem. But it was nowhere near where it needed to be, and it's still not. And when people were asking, why is Western Digital being so loud and proud on what we're doing with RISC-V, even though we didn't have a product at that point, this was the answer. It was because we need to communicate to the world that we are all in and we need to develop this ecosystem. And so that work, that has worked. And we now have an even more vibrant ecosystem. And I'm pretty much expecting when we get to summit three, four, and five, we can't put this on a chart anymore. It would be like trying to chart out the Linux ecosystem, right? It's too big, it's too broad, you just, you cannot fit it on a chart um, unless we get to 0.25 font or something like that. We just can't do it. But those, so this is very exciting and it's showing that it is working and the community is building and we are getting there. All right, so I said, let's review a little bit also of what Western Digital has been up to. So around 2015, um, uh, working with Berkeley and Chris and others, it was a team at Western Digitals before I showed up, right, um, that basically saw the potential of what was, what was possible with RISC-V and joined as a platinum member in the very early days. It was very exciting. Very few people even inside Western Digital even knew this was happening. Um, but, you know, fortunately, uh, the culture there and the, the, the ability for groups to really engage and get things done was, was really positive. And so I started to look at uh, the RISC-V solutions. And the funny part, too, was that during this time, by the way, I was at HP, and I was actually equally, I had never heard of RISC-V. Before I joined Western Digital, never heard of RISC-V. But I was frustrated with the exact same things, which was all of the interfaces in the processor were basically locked down. And we had no way to essentially evolve from an architecture 
that had started with microprocessors in the 70s and originally started with von Neumann in the 1940s. And we were kind of still stuck with that. So it's very gratifying when I joined uh, Western Digital to see that there were people who were equally frustrated and saw the same set of issues. It kind of does the, you know, you're, you're not crazy type of thing. So that's why we, uh, we went all in in 2017 and said, we are going to commit our product portfolio to this. It's going to take many, many years to get there. And, uh, but we are currently delivering a billion cores a year in our products. We expect all of those to move eventually to RISC V. And by the time we get them all done, we should be actually at about 2 billion cores when we went. So then we also went on to, as I said, building the ecosystem, contributing as much as we could to the ecosystem. And you can see some of the things that um, the team has worked on um, in, in order to continue to develop the ecosystem. And I'll give you a hint that this super secret thing, I really want to hug this, but anyway, this super secret thing um, is tied to OmniExtend on this chart. Okay, so I'll give you that hint for now. The other thing I want to call out because it's, um, uh, I've had to explain this to people, is platform I.O. And even inside Western Digital, there's been a, a number of people who are like, why is Martin spending so much time on this platform I.O. thing? And so let me explain that so everybody understands. What happens is a number of people around here are very, very good silicon developers. And they're building SOCs. And about a year or so ago, a startup company, and I won't say who, because my goal is not to embarrass anybody, they had just developed a new SOC with RISC-V, and they wanted me to play with it. I think it was at the point I had done a uh, YouTube set of videos on how to do assembly language programming on RISC-V. And they uh, sent me their platform, and I looked at it very cool. Then I got the how to basically set it up to develop on this platform. It was atrocious. It was beyond bad. It was terrible. In fact, it was so bad, I gave up. So here I had a startup company that was so excited about their new chip and their new platform. They call me, what did you think? Never could even use it because the developer stuff was just so bad. So what happens is I'm trying to encourage everyone to understand that this stuff is hard, right? So it's not, that's the reason I want to mention the company. It's not necessarily meant to be a criticism. It's this stuff is hard. And if you are a great silicon developer, the odds are that doing dev tools is not something you're equally good at. So don't. You don't have to. Just connect up to Platform I.O. You will get a full development environment, a full IDE that works on Linux, Windows, Mac. It connects to about nine different IDEs from Eclipse, VS Code, Atom, and a bunch of cloud ones, and so on and so forth. And it just works one click out of the box, debugging the whole thing, and it's all open source. So if you're doing silicon development, you're building the next great chip, and you know you're going to need a development environment, don't go build a new one. Don't go try to do something on your own. There's one ready out there. So I wanted to explain that so people understand. That go leverage that community. This open source thing is about community. Go leverage it. All right. So now we are basically going to keep going. And um, uh, we will eventually get to our shipping of a billion cores and look at data-centric architectures. All right, so let's put the context of what's the problem we're trying to solve. It's always kind of important to know. And in the processing world today, macro kind of thing, there's sort of two big issues. One is that we are stuck with this legacy architecture. As I said, the first microprocessor was like 1974 or something like that. And I said that architecture was derived from von Neumann from the 1940s. So we in 2020 almost are using an 80-year-old architecture to build servers, platforms, et cetera. Drives me nuts. I can tell you that in my 30 plus years, I've come to the conclusion that architectures have about a seven or eight year lifespan. And after that point, architectures, rather than accelerate you, slow you down. We are well past that point. 
The other big issue is when you start looking at the cost of going, you know, 16, 7, 5 nanometers, it's incredible. And trying to bear that burden all on your own is hard. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this legacy architecture and what I mean. There are two fundamentally bad assumptions that are being made in the processing world today. And I'm kind of talking more data center at this point. Assumption number one is that DRAM must be directly connected to the processor. That is a flawed assumption. It does not need to be that way. And the second assumption is that when you actually bring a collection of processors together to expand your available memory, that that needs to be a homogeneous set of processors. They all need to be the same. That is also a foundationally flawed assumption. And so we cannot have this world continue where everything that Krista was talking about, where we want to build accelerators and uh, specialized processing and IoT applications, et cetera, where your only path to DRAM is through this other processor, where somebody else is in control and, by extension, making you inefficient. That's a problem number one. And this is problem number two. The cost of building these things is going through the roof. And we now know the idea of saying, I'm just going to you know, whip out a new processor year after year after year, regardless of how big the company is, is just not tenable. And development cycles are elongating and getting longer and longer for us to get to the next generation of processor. But the good news is we've all been here before, and there is a different way, and we're kind of seeing this open source thing coming to the silicon and hardware world. So let me tell you a little story. For about eight years while I was at HP, I was the guy responsible for all high-end servers. And that included HP UX, and HP UX was our proprietary version of Unix. HP UX was 88 million lines of code. My annual budget to develop and continue to develop HP UX was $250 million. Just HP UX, just Unix. It was no longer tenable. By the way, uh, uh, buying a license for HP UX was at the low end, 100,000, at the high end, half a million. One license, one server. It just became untenable. Now, the funky part is I also happen to be the Linux and open source guy, and the Linux team worked for me. My annual budget for Linux, $3 million. Okay? That's what happens. I didn't have to do 88 million lines of code. I needed to make sure the stuff worked on our stuff, the, 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 the Linux distributions worked on our stuff. We had some customization that we had to do, but the cost profile was dramatically different. Now, one of the things that people are sometimes challenged when they're new to open source is that they immediately gravitate to open source is free, as in free beer, or it's low cost, right? So, and for those of you who've been doing this for a while, you've heard, you know, if it's free as in freedom, not free as in free beer. Um, it's a very old line to try and explain the difference. Um, the English language is such that the word free um, is confusing in this context. This doesn't happen in other languages. And so, um, open source is far more than about free software and licensing and those kinds of things. It's about community and collaboration. And it's about the give and take. And I'll say in the US, most European Western nations have really gotten this very well, that they basically, if they're gonna take from the community, they need to give back to the community. And that process is working very well. There are other countries around the world that still struggle to fully endorse and adopt. They, they, they got the take part, right? That, that, that part's easy, right? I know how to take. If it's free, I know how to take, right? 
But then what happens is they modify, they change, they adapt, they whatever, customize for their environment, and then they're left with this maintenance nightmare that they now have to own the entire stack, and it's like basically they had their own proprietary thing. So if we can get planet Earth to fully understand that open source, yes, is about, open is about uh, freedom, but it's about collaboration. And so we've uh, worked hard in um, uh, participating in creating the Chips Alliance as a mechanism for providing collaboration when it comes to silicon development. So let's put that in context with some of the real stuff um, that we're doing. This is a simplified picture of what a data center server architecture should more closely resemble. Now this is oversimplified um, because I, I did not include a third fabric. In fact, in Western Digital, I call this triple fabrics. And the three fabrics are storage, memory, and networking. And the beauty of this actually is all three fabrics are built on top the same ethernet. But the point that I wanted to highlight here is that memory or DRAM is not tied to any specific processor or processing engine. And that is, I'll say, my ultimate goal and being able to em embrace the freedom that RISC-V gives us is to basically be able to have an architecture where everybody can connect to DRAM unfettered access and all be coherently connected together. So just the way you think about a network fabric, think about a large pool of memory all shared on one consistent fabric. As I said, if I was doing the more complicated version of this picture, you'd have the triple fabrics and you'd also have a storage fabric in there. And the point here is it's called a data center. It is not called a CPU center, right? It's about the data. Make the data the center of the universe, not the processor. So why did we do this? And, and I will confess to you, uh, when we announced this uh, just under a year ago, we were talking about the fact that we were releasing uh, a Swerve, our Swerve core, our open source core, and we thought that was the big news. Everybody was gonna like, gravitate to that. And then we were also announcing a new instruction set simulator. All that was open source. People would gravitate. And then we kind of lumped in, hey, OmniExtend, let's do an open source coherent memory fabric. And I genuinely thought that this would be tertiary at best in the list of announcements. And then we did some pre-briefings with the press and analysts and stuff, and it's the only thing anybody wanted to talk about was this. And I was completely taken off guard by this. But we did this because in order to unshackle memory, we needed to have a protocol and a switching mechanism to allow all elements to come together and share main memory. And working in partnership with Sci-5, we were able to extend some of their intellectual property um, and, and bring all of this together to create uh, something that's pretty special. So ended up creating this chart because of that event. People said, why are you, why are you creating yet another memory protocol, fabric, connector, whatever, there's all the, them out there. And by the way, I got phone calls from people like, I, I was like, wow. Um, I got people who were really passionate about C6 or OpenCAPI or something else. And they were like, no, you gotta, and I said, look, in fact, I'll tell you a story. I was invited to go give a talk at a particular company. I won't mention the company other than to say sponsors of CCIX. And I said, uh, and so I go and I give a nice presentation. And then I get taken into a room, you know, and you're kind of like, wow, what's happening here? You know, you get escorted into this room. Please take a seat. I'm like, wow, what's going on here? CEO of the company comes in. Wow, hi, how you doing? We need you on CCIX, you gotta stop this omni, whoa. 
So basically, all I did, I was like, look, we, don't, we, don't want, we didn't want to create something new. We didn't create something new just because like, hey, cool, let's go do something new. That's very bad. In open source land, when you just do something new for the sake of it, very bad. You get ostracized very quickly. So I walked through this list and I said, well, is it based on an open interconnect like Ethernet? No. Can I have a fabric version? No. That's the problem I'm trying to solve. I need a fabric, I need it open, I want it on Ethernet, please, can, like, can somebody give me something? Remember, I was at HP for 30 years. I was the guy who started Gen Z at HP. And so they were like, what, like what's going on? Because again, we, it, it wasn't because we didn't want to use something, it was we had a problem we needed to solve. So that's why we created this chart, so people understood that we just basically needed to have something. So, all of the Omni Extend work that we started, we, have already, we had already open sourced all of the code related to uh, switching, and now it is all being done in Chips Alliance, open to everyone. And now here comes the exciting part. Now you can't all just leave after I'm done with this, right? You gotta, so there's like just a couple more slides, okay? Ugh. This, I, now I'm gonna be careful here. This is a very real board, okay? So this is not a fake, this is not a stage prop. This is like real. Um, I wish we had a camera, but I'm gonna be very careful with this. This is a board um, that is internally codenamed Houdini, okay? So this is Houdini. This is the mother of all heat sinks. Um, and uh, that's because, and I just found out before here that uh, because the barefoot Tofino um, switch that's underneath this thing is 340 watts. So um, it needs uh, a little help. So this, folks, this is what a server in the future can, should, and needs to look like. When somebody comes to me and says, I want to build a Xeon class processor, but I want to put RISC-V cores in it, eh, knock yourself out. That's like completely uninteresting and even boring to me. Because it doesn't change the state of the art. It doesn't change the foundational problems of the architecture we've been living with for too long. So what Houdini allows you to do is to plug in any kind of memory, DRAM, any kind of accelerator card, and all the specs, all available, all open source, and plug them into this, and essentially everyone can share. And the Tofino uh, P4 code, as I said, is already um, open source, so you basically have now a completely open, coherent memory fabric. This can then be on an ethernet, uh, network, you can have multiples of these all connected together, and this, this changes the answer, this changes the game. Like I said, it's going to take a while for people to fully grok that and internalize that, but I'm convinced it will happen when people see the potential of not always having to be routed through a processor in order to be able to get access to main memory. I am very excited. Thank you guys, this is like awesome. So really, congratulations to the team at Western Digital that worked on this. I know it's been a huge amount of work uh, putting all the pieces together, so it's very, very exciting. All right, so a couple of other announcements I wanna make. So um, as you all know, about a year ago, we announced Swerve, which was our first RISC-V core. Um, and we open sourced that, we put everything in GitHub, but as part of this collaboration and um, uh, working with the Chips Alliance, um, all of that is now going to basically be part of um, the Chips Alliance going forward. Um, and we're, uh, we're excited to share that with you. Now there's another uh, part to this, which is we are taping out our first SOC uh, based on the Swerve Core. So those billion processors that I talk about, or billion cores, I should say, this is basically a few hundred million that are gonna come out of this when the first products um, based on Swerve Core with full SOC capabilities come out. 
The other thing is we had people calling us and saying, hey, can we use your Swerve Core? We said, hey, go to GitHub, download, it's all yours, knock yourself out. You don't have to call us, you don't have to ask us permission, you don't have to do any of that stuff, just kind of go get it. And so as far as we know, there's a bunch of people using Swerve and we have no idea. And that's okay, that's what open source is all about. But still we had people say, yeah, but I need support, I need to be able to have somebody I can call if I need help and that kind of stuff. And I had said, we don't want to be in the processor business, that's not what we do. Um, but the good people at CodaSIP um, essentially partnered with us. Uh, we're giving them special training and access to the developers of Swerve and, and our Swerve cores. And they will basically create a commercial version um, of the Swerve core with full support capabilities behind it. Um, and they'll have sort of the back pipe to us. Uh, for those of you familiar with open source, this would be, and the analogy would be, Swerve would be like the Linux kernel, and what CodaSIP is doing like Red Hat or SUSE and doing like the full commercial distribution, okay? Because we don't want to be in that business, but we're essentially giving them a pipe back to that. So I thought that was pretty exciting too. Now here's a, you know, funky thing that happens. When we first started working on Swerve, we had a bunch of PowerPoint slides. And you go to development teams and you say, look at my PowerPoint slides, isn't it great? You should base your product on this. All right, so if you've been in part of a big company and you're, uh, you're responsible, you're accountable for delivering a product, you are not gonna base your future on a set of PowerPoint slides, okay? We knew that, we understood that. And we just basically wanna make sure everybody knew what we were doing, but the team went off and did the work. And out came Swerve. And so now it wasn't PowerPoint anymore, it was real. And interestingly enough, then what happened, people said, whoa, if you can do that where you have better uh, or lower power, lower area, higher performance, all like, wow, that's like pretty cool. So if you can do that, here's kind of the, our next in the list of problems we're trying to solve. And on the right-hand side, it was like, hey, could we have like something even smaller, like lower performance, lower power, lower everything for like our really small applications? And then at the other end of the spectrum, they said, look, we got some area problems and you know, we want, but we need more processing. I, like it's, I know this has never been done before, but is there any way to get like a multi-threaded swerve? Like, could that possibly be done? And of course, you know, the team casually, sure. What the heck? And that's what they did. On the left is what we believe to be the world's first embedded, multi-threaded, real-time core. Can't buy this from, I'll, I'll use company names, Arm, uh, uh, um, Synopsys, Cadence. Like, as far as we know, there is no such thing as a multi-threaded embedded core for these kinds of applications. Yeah, there's multi-threaded stuff at the desktop mobile server end, but not here. So this is quite significant in terms of accomplishment for the team. And then of course, saying, hey, yes, we can go down, we can do a lower performance, lower power um, application. So those will all be um, open source through the Chips Alliance and uh, available through the Chips Alliance GitHub. So we're continuing along those lines. So. That's exciting. This is like cool stuff. Oh, thank you. All right, so just to recap, right? So we have OmniExtend and a very real manifestation and you should go build your own, like go grab the files, go build one. And I mean, call me, tell me, show me what you can do with this. Um, because it's incredible. But you know, build an accelerator, put it in there, have it coherently accessed, and be awesome. And we're taping out Swerve in now a full SOC, first instance into our products, and that'll be the first hundred, few hundred million in our commitment, and um, two more open source cores uh, for the embedded market. And so we are uh, definitely on the trajectory for a billion cores and um, delivering data center solutions. <coughs> So what's next? Want to keep going. Keep going down this path of unshackling memory, making memory a full DRAM, a full citizen in the data center that does not need permission from somebody else to be there. 
We want to do this in a collaborative way and bring everybody along and leveraging the power of what is open source. We've seen that work. We're going to execute on this roadmap. And part of the reason I don't want to write down this roadmap is these two other cores I just showed you. What happens is the more this team is doing, the more the rest of the company sees what's possible, the more we basically just adapt and say, sure, we can do that. And so we're going to keep doing that and keep listening to our customers and responding to that. And we want to continue to be a very productive contributor to the overall ecosystem to advance and accelerate through some of the challenges that RISC-V still has in the community. And finally, um, tonight we have uh, a party that uh, Microchip, Sci-5, and Western Digital all got together fun. We hope you will come and join us. Please bring your badge. That's going to be your entry. Everybody's invited. Um, a bunch of Star Wars-y things, I'm told. Um, and so come and have some fun um, and, uh, and enjoy the party. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.